everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your evening to come and uh, hear me talk about fake news. Uh, so, I've been a, a journalist for almost uh, 17, 18 years. I'm actually Australian, if you couldn't tell by my accent, but I was a reporter and presenter in Australia covering network news for almost 10 years there. But I moved to the UK and decided to do more producing, more managing and editing uh, behind the scenes. So I have worked at, um, as a contractor, a freelancer at CNN, Al Jazeera and the BBC. I was also a freelance correspondent for Australian TV in London and Europe for a good many years. And, uh, but I obviously took a full-time staff job at the BBC uh, in 2013 and I've been there ever since. So you can have a look, that's quite a headline, trust and impartiality in the fake news era. It's a lot to get through. So in 2016, it will go down as one of the biggest years for European news ever and American news with Leicester winning the Premier League, uh, Brexit and Nigel Farage and obviously the election of Donald Trump in the United States. Now, if every one of you in the room put about $1 on... If you bet $1 on these three events happening, we would all be very rich and about $60 million richer, we wouldn't need to go to work. Basically, no one expected all these three things to happen. So this is one video that we run on our uh, network to promote our impartiality. When you've covered the story from every angle, when you've reported the facts, whatever the obstacles, if you've asked the questions, others won't. When you've never taken sides in any war, revolution or election, when you've come under fire from people in power around the world, and you've always championed the truth, then you can call yourself the most trusted brand in news. Hello, I'm Cathy Kay, this is BBC. It's obviously, with, you know, asking tough questions and not being influenced from either side being fair to both sides. So we are living in uh, uncertain, confusing times when it can be very hard to know what to believe. We hear the words like fake news, hoaxes, alternative facts and post-truth. And you can see by some of these headlines that you know even the biggest news organisations, including the BBC, get it wrong sometimes. So what's helping this happen is something called uh, social obviously social media, it's, it's enabling fake news stories to spread. There's someone once said that a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. And this is a challenge because of the sheer number of stories that are being shared via social platforms like Facebook and Twitter. So obviously at the start of the presentation I showed you Lester winning the premiership, uh, Donald Trump winning the election in the United States and Brexit uh, happening and uh, Nigel Farage celebrating. Um, so we're going to talk about why are we talking about all of this right now. So our director of BBC News and Current Affairs, James Harding, said, because we are living in an age of instability, normal rules disrupted by low growth and high inequality, technological innovation spurring behavioural change and job insecurity, identity politics supplanting the old parties and fueling narratives of exclusion. Looking at how sometimes things might be covered in the press, sometimes it can be um, uh, very unfair, sometimes personal opinions seep through. So you've got two very different headlines here, um, one pro-Trump and one anti-Trump, and it was all about a press conference he gave at the White House. Now this press conference back in February of this year was really quite something. It was one of the most extraordinary press conferences I think anyone's ever seen. And our correspondent was uh, lucky enough to ask a question and this was the response that he got. Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Okay. Here's another beauty. It's a good line. <laughs> Impartial, free and fair. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, Mr. President. Just like CNN, right? Um, on the travel ban, uh, we could banter back and forth. On the travel ban, uh, would you accept that that was a good example of the smooth running of government? Yeah, I do. I do. Let me tell you about the travel ban. Wait, wait, wait. I know who you are. Just wait. Let me tell you about the travel ban. We had a very smooth rollout of the travel ban. But we had a bad court. You know, there's this sort of toing and froing going on, on a lot with, between Trump and the media. And obviously, 
it's very hard for us to decipher what's right, what's wrong. So Peggy Noonan, who wrote for Ronald Reagan at uh, one stage, said this, here is the fact of the age, people believe nothing. They think everything is spin and lies. The minute a government says something is true, half the people on earth know it's a lie. And when people believe nothing, as we know, they will believe anything. So it's really interesting. This is a graph of trust and, you know, where we, you know, which countries um, think that they can trust the news. And, and the question is, do you agree that you can trust news most of the time? So in Finland, Germany and the UK, they tend to agree. But obviously, having a look at the United States, it's more balanced. And so they obviously don't trust the media a lot of the time. So someone said from Edelman, um, they wrote a report on why trust matters. In the face of an expanding universe of information, every day increasingly feels like April Fool's Day. It is a simple evil for us all if people do not trust what they read or hear or see. Do you guys have April Fool's Day in Belarus? Mm. That's how it feels sometimes with fake news. Um, so this was an article on the front page of the Sun newspaper in the United Kingdom. So the Sun led with a front page saying the Queen supports Brexit. So the Queen complained. So our political editor of the BBC, she heard the same information. She had the same source that the Queen supports Brexit. But we decided not to run with the story because we didn't have it from two sources. We, we generally require double sourcing for most of the stories that we tell. So we have this uh, book here. It's quite thick, as you can see. It's our editorial guidelines. And the BBC's core values stand firm with trust at the heart of what we do. Basically, some of the, these are some of the words that we do our work by. Independence, the trust, accuracy, credibility, integrity, impartiality. So I want to play you a video now. This was of when Donald Trump went to Japan recently. There are two little parts of a report back to back. And the first part of the report came through very early in the day. And the second, see if you can notice the difference, but the second came later in the day. And when spoon feeding precious koi carp at the palace, it appears he lost patience and tipped in the whole box of food. For President Trump, this visit has been a success. He has avoided any serious gaffes, and in Shinzo Abe, he has found a kindred spirit. So most of the media figured that Trump just lost patience and tipped the, all of the fish food into the water. But in actual fact, he didn't lose patience. It's just that he saw Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan, do it, so he just followed what he was doing. But obviously, it was a mistake. Um, we picked it up and we rectified that, but most of the media thought he just lost patience and... and but. In actual fact, he was doing the right thing. He was just... Uh, but we didn't see those pictures. So once we saw them, we corrected our mistake. So the lesson from that is sometimes it's best to stick with what you know. And again, just to re-emphasise the following words, truth, accuracy, impartial, impartiality, fair and open-minded and independent. They're really important things as part of being a journalist, for us anyway. And if anyone wants to read it, it's all there. It's nice uh, bedtime reading, um, but I do have to take it back with me. <laughs> this morning I set a competition to anyone who could finish it within the presentation, got a prize, but no one finished it, unsurprisingly. So I'm just going to skim through some of the things that are in this sort of book that help us tell our story. So we have editorial integrity and independence. And so we say the BBC is independent of outside interests and arrangements that could undermine our editorial integrity. Our audiences should be confident that our decisions are not influenced by outside interests, political or commercial pressures or any personal interests. Okay, this is really um, interesting. Uh, it's basically about context and obviously terrorism is a, is a huge deal for all of us um, to address and, you know, it's something that we are all concerned about. But trying to provide context to a story, you look at, say, this, so this is a list of the number of Americans killed annually by a certain thing. Killed by, on average, Islamic jihadist immigrants, armed toddlers, 21 people are killed on average every year by armed babies, basically. Falling out of bed, 737 people die each year from falling out of bed, apparently. And being shot by another American, 11,737 people a year. So these are all just as important, this one, and these ones are, are no less important than the other, but, you can see in context, it's actually 
a big, big difference. So there was a, also a recent survey. Immigration is also a big thing as well, especially in Europe, people moving between borders. So this, again, is about context, putting things into perspective. So people were asked uh, what they think the pot percentage of their population is who are immigrants. So basically, what is the population, uh, what is the immigrant population uh, percentage-wise? So 25% people in the United Kingdom thought that 25% of their population were immigrants. In the United States, people surveyed thought that 33% of their population were made up of immigrants. And in Sweden, people thought 25% of their population was made up of immigrants. So what's interesting are the facts coming from the governments and uh, from the information that we can verify. And this is uh, the actual number. So all of them much smaller than what people expected. So how we do this sort of work is by um, what's called uh, data journalism. So it's quite visual. You can see we have interactive, for example, um, elections, for example. We have interactive maps where you can go into each region and see how people voted. So that helps us explain things. And sure, it, it, it takes a bit longer and it's, a, it's quite uh, involved, but it's important to get context for a story. This comes to an idea of what we're calling slow news. So, slow news means more in-depth analysis of topics and issues, issues impacting people today. Uh, the director of BBC News and Current Affairs, James Harding, said, we need to explain what's driving the news. We need slow news, news with depth, data, investigations, analysis, expertise to help us explain the world we're living in. So, that's basically explaining slow news. We're looking at uh, weighing in on the battle over lies, distortions and exaggerations in the news. The BBC can't edit the internet, but we won't stand aside either. So you look at this cartoon here. Uh, you know, when someone's doing some research for a story, they're researching on the internet, and it's very hard to know what's right and wrong. So you're researching the story, you're in class or at work or in the office or at the press club in Belarus, and uh, you Google something... Um, and it comes up with literally the first link that agrees with what you already believe. And then you think, jackpot, I found it straight away. That isn't always the case, as you know. Like, it's when you Google something or research something, the first thing that pot pops up, you really can't trust it because a lot of the time it's paid for by Google to, to feature at the top of your browser. And I think, you, you know, it's teaching us to be scrutinised things that we see that little bit more. Michaela, if we could play the, the video. This is our uh, unit called Reality Check. It's the BBC's fact-checking team. Let's do a BBC Reality Check on this. We know this isn't the first time North Korea has fired missiles into Japan's exclusive economic zone. In fact, go back to August of last year and you can see the BBC reporting as much. What we don't know is what type of missiles were used, but experts are saying that they were most likely to have been medium-range missiles. And if that's the case, it doesn't represent a significant breakthrough in North Korea's capabilities. So basically, you know, the up the, the, the conclusion is that North Korea really wasn't using any new warheads. So it didn't really represent an escalation. It's something they always had access to. So that one was the middle one there. But the other two ones that we've done is one saying, uh, one of our reality checks was, is banning Turkish rallies EU policy? And the other one that we've done from the United States was, who released the Guantanamo reoffenders? So I'd really encourage you, if you've got some time, just to have a look at um, bbc.com, BBC Reality Check. If you have a look, you can see some of the investigations that we've done just to try to break down uh, some of these so-called fake news claims um, dumb, and to correct, basically taking the time to set the record straight. Uh, Trump, a little while ago, said that you know terror attacks uh, are being underreported. We go back and think about these things because sometimes, you know, when, when you, we've got to take what governments say seriously, we have, to, we have to look at what they're saying and what they're telling us. But what we then can go back and say, well, actually, did we cover terror attacks? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so the program that I'm working on at the moment is, is called Beyond 100 Days. And how that came about was because we had... Uh, a lot of people were interested in Donald Trump after his election and a lot of people were surprised by Brexit as well. And so this is a, a little video that promotes our show. 
Today, President Trump fulfilled one of his key election pledges. James Comey told senators at a blockbuster hearing that Donald Trump lied about his firing. They're calling it the Brexit election. Does your wife manage to stop you tweeting, Christian, at weekends? No. <laughs> no. This is a much more dangerous world. It got more dangerous yesterday. Making sense of the stories shaping our world. There must be some sort of strategy, you would think. Beyond 100 Days on BBC World News. So we try, we, we, we cover a lot of Trump news and we cover a lot of Brexit, so we're never out of ideas, basically. Yeah. And, and this is just one example I'm about to give of being fair in your coverage of news. When Donald Trump was in Asia with his wife, the First Lady Melania Trump, uh, they went to an event in South Korea uh, where the First Lady was upstaged by a massive superstar in South Korea. So, well, let's watch the, watch the video and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, after it. Now, there is a certain celebrity status, isn't there, to the US presidency. We can all agree the Commander-in-Chief is one of the most recognisable people in the world. And when it comes to the Trumps, that star status knows no bounds. Except, it seems, in the sat case of South Korea. A video has emerged of fans going wild at an event earlier this week attended by the First Lady Melania Trump. But were they wild for her? I love that. I love that. My daughter would react to <laughs> exactly the same way. But I really love that video because you get the real sense of Melania's personality there. She took it so well, mm -hmm. didn't she? Yeah, and actually it's interesting because some of the South Korean press had labelled her, I think, robotic Melania during the trip because she was so poised and so careful and didn't give much away. And actually they all loved it when she, and you saw it on those tweets yeah. there, that when she actually broke into that spontaneous smile, I have no idea if she knew who the K-pop singer was. <laughs> Which, actually, Christian, would you I, have no, recognised him? Don't go there. Go on, be honest. You know me and showbiz. <laughs> Some of the journalists in South Korea thought that Melania Trump was very stiff, very composed. But actually that video showed that she was actually a, a human. She actually, you know, she could show a lighter side. So that's showing, you know, like sometimes, you know, things aren't always what they seem. And if you can show something like that to help explain and be fair to your you know, your, your audience and, and the people you're covering, then I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, but basically, it's just to really, uh, you know, talk about the idea of editorial integ integrity and independence. So we've... Uh, we, but the two big words we're talking about here are accuracy and impartiality. This was a recent um, trust rating, like a recent um, spreadsheet looking at, you know, who people around the world trust when they look to for their news. Um, and this is just a little video about being free, fair and impartial. It's just a, a video on events that have taken place over the last 12 to 18 months and it really does make us all rethink about how we tell a story. The British people have spoken and the answer is we're out. Grief is still obvious in this street where people were indiscriminately shot dead. The so-called Islamic State claimed responsibility, but it's not been verified. The false story about this church has helped to harden the political mood here. <laughs> We're travelling with the army chief. A soldier showed me a shell improvised by rebels. He's saying that this is C4.
Well, how accurate is Mr Abe's claim? Let's do a BBC reality check on this. I don't see you being restrained and asking me any questions. That's not really the point, is it? Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Here's another beauty. Impartial, free and fair. Never Some people say that you're a bit of a fascist. It seems the White House wants to undermine the conventional media. France was just beginning to feel safe again after the attacks here last year. So obviously lots of events, um, not only in the past 18 months, but going back many, many, many years. Uh, but everything we do, we, we do with, we, we want our audiences to trust what we're doing. And we have, um, you know, when you go to work, you wear a, a lanyard, like a, a your, your security pass around your neck. Basically, when you wear a security, our security pass um, has on the back of on the back of our security pass, free, fair, and impartial. And uh, with that, uh, uh Hello, my name is Inga. Uh, I also work. Uh was working for media. Uh, uh, мой вопрос uh, такой, что нам показывали инфографику, которая была очень интересная, потому что она хорошо визуализировала то, uh, какие результаты были голосования в США и в Великобритании. Она хорошо показывала, кто голосовал за Трампа и за выход Великобритании из Европейского Союза. Но в то же время, до того, как это произошло, BBC предоставляла платформу для высказывания, в том числе про Brexit, кого не кандидатов, но те, кто значит, был за, за выход Великобритании из Европейского Союза, и э, они сами создавали внутри своих высказываний как бы ну, недостоверную информацию. То есть вопрос э, следующий. Как BBC отрабатывала те недостоверные факты, которые они создавали? Хорошо ли они это делали? Довольны ли они результатами? Все. А, да, Инга меня зовут. Окей, это очень хороший вопрос. Работать в Лондоне иногда чувствуется, как работать в бабле. Many, you, many of your friends feel the same, many of your colleagues feel the same, but it's once you get outside of London and speak to real, like, real people that you get an idea that perhaps what many millions of people in London think, that's not necessarily the case elsewhere in the country. And I give that example because we, one of our correspondents went and spoke to many, many, many different people all over the United Kingdom. And it was a week before the Brexit referendum. And when he came back, he said, Britain is going to leave the European Union. And many of us in London were thinking, wh where, why, how? Because the view is very different and it, it's taught us to think about a big picture. So the same could also be said, um, I worked in the United States for the US election and, and similar principles. Once you get outside of Washington, incredibly different. People that you think might feel the same way as someone in Washington does really they don't. So I think real voices and speaking to as many different people from as many different backgrounds as possible. It, do, it does help us as journalists because we as journalists are human as well. We're, we are imperfect, you know, but the, the way to get around that is to speak to as many different people from as many different backgrounds as possible. And by getting that perspective, it helps us put a fair story across because we're yeah. not just putting our perspective across, of course. We are trying to represent the views of everyone in the country. So I hope that first answers the first part of your question. With respect to fake news, if the President of the United States keeps saying something often enough, I think we have a duty to follow up on that. And for whatever reason, the President feels that there is a lot of fake news around. Now, we can't say that his opinion is wrong because that's his opinion and that's what he believes. But we can do our best to try and inform our audiences by doing things like reality check. And we were talking about this this morning, where there, there is such a demand for news fast and now, that it's now more important than ever to do slow news, to try and pr provide context through those graphs and graphics to try and explain things better to our audience. And, and we've always done that, but now we have a dedicated team purely to do that. Ну, если позволите, один вопрос еще от меня. Вот, конечно, все это хорошо, о чем вы говорите, но согласитесь, что в мире, в мире наполненном неточностями, неправдой и даже ложью, которая порой звучит из уст официальных лиц, которым 
по крайней мере, на Западе привыкли доверять в какой-то мере. Тем, кто исповедует, тем, кто ставит во главу угла принцип беспристрастности, приходится тяжелее всего. Потому что эти медиа они вынуждены предоставлять одинаковое количество времени разным сторонам. И получается, что сторона, которая говорит правду, получает какое-то время, и это же количество времени получает та сторона, которая производит неточности, неправду или откровенную ложь. Reality check и slow news — это, конечно, хорошо, но действительно принципе медиапотребления они во многом остаются в том, что потребляется breaking news, потребляется новость здесь и сейчас. Очень большая проблема во многих странах состоит в том, что если фейковая новость распространилась, то потом просто очень много людей ее расшарили, она разослась по интернету, и опровергнуть ее достаточно сложно. Какие ответы на это есть у новостников, у тех, кто работает с событиями, фактами здесь и сейчас? Okay. Another good question. So you're quite right. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, news is, there's a pressure to get news out fast. And, and sometimes on, you know, both government and opposition, for example, uh, may say things that you don't agree with or the opposition or the government doesn't agree with. Certainly from uh, our coverage of, uh, of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, it was important to give both sides, uh, I guess, a platform to... to, to to voice their concerns and to um, share their campaign with, the, you know, with, with our audience. Um, but with anything, and with exactly what I'm saying now, that once you say something publicly and it goes out there, you, you, you know that people have the right to challenge you. And that doesn't mean uh, being nasty or does, it doesn't mean um, being angry. It's just a, a conversation between people. I think that's what journalism is. It's, it's a great big conversation. I think it's very much about, um, uh, you know, putting... I think you need to put both sides of the story across because otherwise you will lose trust from someone. It's like when we correct our mistakes, we acknowledge them and we correct them and hopefully our viewers will know that when we make a mistake, we correct it and they trust us to keep doing that. It's like the Trump, uh, the fish feeding video. Like people picked up, they said, hang on, that's wrong because, you know, he was just doing what the Japan Prime Minister was doing. So, we, you know, that was right and we corrected it. As, as to, you know, fast news and news coming out really quickly, I think there is a real thirst. I mean, you, you've only got to pick up your phone or your tablet or, and you get your news straight away, which is why we have that team reality check to sit alongside that breaking news, that they're able to try and decipher that information. Sure, if we get two individual sources, we'll roll the information out, but it's because of fast news we have slow news now. Меня зовут Наталья Горячко-Басалыга, я являюсь правозащитником. Скажите, пожалуйста, сотрудникам BBC совершенно нельзя выражать свое мнение? Или все-таки они иногда в своих публикациях его выражают? И второй вопрос. Как все же работает ваш отдел проверки реальности? На чем он основывается и какие материалы берет в качестве контроля проверки реальности? Например... Просто я приведу случай, ну, немножко трагический. Когда начинались события в Украине в 2014 году, военные действия, я, я, как и многие правозащитники, были в зоне АТО, привозили много видео, много фото, но нам никто не верил, потому что нам противостояла целая махина такая, целая система, разработанная в РФ, которая публиковала массу фейковых новостей, и поэтому нас просто никто не слышал. No, we can't express our opinion um, when we're telling a, a story. It does, you know, we broadcast in uh, many languages, we have many TV stations, we have many radio stations. You know what, sometimes with all of those journalists, working in sometimes very pressured situations, that maybe sometimes they, you know, their experiences filter through in their reporting. But we don't set out to do a story, and I certainly don't set out to do a story trying to get my opinion on air. I mean, you, you may not agree with the people you're interviewing, um, but I think the beauty of journalism is being able to talk to them as adults about it and try to be as neutral as possible because you've got, you know, 
two, you, a lot of the times you have many different sides and many different arguments. And, and you don't have to agree with someone, but you do need to give them a right of reply. Um, on your second question, that was an incredibly challenging time, uh, Ukraine. I wasn't there. Uh, I was in London, but I was seeing a lot of the pictures coming back. And I think the challenge for us is when we're presented with third party uh, material, it's impossible to verify. Not necessarily, it doesn't mean not taking someone's word for it. It doesn't mean we don't think it happened and we, we, we're not doubting what we're seeing. We are who we are because we source everything vigorously. We, we would need a separate source of information to verify um, what you were bringing to that coverage. But and, and you're right, you're absolutely right. News organisations are huge and sometimes things get lost in the machine. But, but I can tell you very, very little um, uh, video and pictures from third parties really make it... We, we, we must scrutinise everything to, you know, the nth degree, basically. We, we try to verify everything as, as much as we can. That's why I hope our audiences trust us, because they know when we try, when we put something to air, we, we try and verify it uh, over and over and over again. Uh, Adam, большое спасибо за интересные вопросы, интересные ответы. Uh, Равин Григорий Абрамович, помимо того, что у меня есть духовный сан, я еще также пишу статьи для Народной газеты и даю интервью на телевидении. Uh, два, но коротких вопроса. Есть ли случаи, когда реалити чек или служба, которая проверяет информацию, ошибается? Это второй вопрос. Какая реакция редакции BBC на то, что журналист изложил факты правильно, но сместил так акценты, что материал рассказывает совершенно о другом? So to uh, your first question, um, has reality check ever been wrong? I certainly don't know if it has been. I haven't heard. Uh, if it has been wrong in the past, I, I genuinely don't know. I, I don't think so because it, we it, would hear a lot about it. But in the UK, we have a program called Newswatch, which is done by the BBC. And it picks up all of our mistakes. Yeah. And if we've made a mistake, we have to go on that program to explain ourselves to the audience. And that's about being open and honest. Um, and your second question was... Okay, so it's all about interpretation. One journalist, not knowing the entire story, assumed that the president lost patience. Uh, he was corrected and told he was wrong. We had an email that went around like that to say, don't use that story, it's not correct, and we will correct it, and that's what we did as soon as we could. So when you, when you like, it's inevitable. We're, we're all going to make mistakes. We, we do, we're human beings. We work under very pressured environments. And I think audiences know we make mistakes. But I think trust is developed by acknowledging those mistakes. If everything we do is accountable. It's on the record from our new software to the, the way we communicate. Everything is totally accountable. And while managers won't be happy at all, they won't be happy, I think there's an understanding that we are all human beings at the end of the day. Большое спасибо, что вы все пришли и до встречи в пресс-клубе.